All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 26, Section 3, The Second New Deal. So last section, 26.2, talked about the first New Deal. And while the first New Deal did solve some of the problems and things improved in the US economy in the midst of the Great Depression, um, by no means was the Depression over. And in fact, uh, approaching was the 1936 election. And the question was, you know, from the first New Deal, did Roosevelt do enough? And uh, the belief was, uh, by many, and even by Roosevelt himself, uh, no. Then, in fact, more needed to be done. And that spurred Roosevelt's second New Deal, which was a new wave of legislation meant to further address the problems of American society. Uh, but also to, you know, Roosevelt wanted to win this election. He ended up winning it by a huge margin, uh, that, that, you know, granted. But uh, on the eve of that election, there was a question as to whether or not Roosevelt was doing enough. So uh, a lot of people challenged Roosevelt. There were a lot of uh, critics, right, on all sides. One criticism came from conservatives. You know, these were people who were typically pro-business. Uh, kind of the uh, free market capitalism, uh, hands off, a government that does least does best. Uh, so, of course, they felt that Roosevelt had done too much, that he had kind of permanently damaged the economy. This illustration here probably best illustrates this conservative critici criticism. Here is Roosevelt who is asking for more power, right, more power. He's power hungry. Uh, he's permanently altering and damaging the American economy. Um, and this challenge came also from the U.S. Supreme Court, which the job or the purpose of the Supreme Court is to determine if laws are constitutional. Right, that's the job. And the Constitution essentially is the rule book. So everything that was passed by the first New Deal up here was passed by the US Congress and signed by the president. But of course, that doesn't prevent the Congress or the president from passing something that is unconstitutional, right? Unconstitutional. And in the you know, 1935, 1936, the Supreme Court ruled on two pieces of legislation, the AAA, which is the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and the NIRA, the Supreme Court ruled that both of these are unconstitutional. In other words, that the rule book, the Constitution, did not give Congress and President Roosevelt the authority to, in this case, set prices for agricultural goods or provide farmers incentives not to grow crops. And in fact, you can't tell businesses they have to cooperate with each other, that businesses are free to do whatever they want. So these were both struck down. So in a lot of ways, the Supreme Court became uh, kind of an opponent of Roosevelt to check, of course, his growing power over the U.S. economy. However, I would say that there were still a lot of critics coming from the other side of Roosevelt. Not that he did too much, right? Not that he took too much power, but rather that he did not do enough. And sort of these people right here, uh, they would fit into the camp of, you know, Roosevelt is not doing enough to solve the problem of the economic depression. Dr. Francis Townsend raised the question about, you know, what about the elderly, right? Remember that Roosevelt had a lot of work programs. What if you were too old to work? Then what should you do about that population? Uh, Charles Coughlin wanted Roosevelt to go even further with nationalizing the industry, that he still didn't do enough for the people, as he called them. Right, too much for banks, too much for businesses, more should be done for the people. Upton Sinclair brought up the a point about poverty, especially in California. And perhaps Roosevelt's greatest critic was Huey Long, who was from uh, Louisiana. He was, I believe, a governor or a governor of Louisiana or senator. Um, and he was poised to challenge, he was gonna challenge Roosevelt in the 1936 election, and this is Huey Long right here, uh, but he was assassinated 
And what he proposed was the share our wealth society, which more or less would take from the rich and give to the poor, that each American family would get a salary of $5,000 a year guaranteed. And that money would come from those who had an excess. Huey Long said, look, once you make a certain amount of money, uh, I don't remember exactly what the price tag was, but once you make a certain amount of money, the US government's gonna put a cap on that. And any money in excess of that amount is gonna be taken from the rich and give to the poor. Huey Long was nicknamed Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Hood for his plan. But again, was assassinated and ended up not challenging Roosevelt in the 1936 election to which Roosevelt won it by a very comfortable margin, one of the most lopsided uh, elections in presidential history. And so Roosevelt heard loud and clear, a lot of this actually on the eve of the 1936 election, Roosevelt wanted to make sure that, yeah, he was doing enough to uh, solve the economic problem, but also to answer to a lot of the criticisms. And so that's what the Second New Deal does, right? So the Second New Deal is a new wave of legislation in the mid-1930s done to address maybe a lot of these critics. Uh, the Banking Act put more regulation over private banks. Probably the strongest banking regu regulation ever in American history. The WPA, this was another work program, so put Americans back to work. It also provided unemployment relief and also provided funds for what we might call, um, you know, maybe we'll just say cultural jobs. So unlike before where a lot of the jobs that were created were uh, those that demanded physical labor, right? Go out and build a dam, build a hospital, build the Golden Gate Bridge like they did under the New Deal. Uh, these were cultural jobs, writers, art uh, artists, sculptors, uh, you know, and a lot of the work that was created, the artistic work. And so this could employ people maybe who had disabilities, who weren't able to physically, uh, you know, meet the requirement and also expanded the number of people who fell under this job program. Social Security gave a pension to the elderly, right? So this was Dr. Townsend's critique. Social Security is still a program today. Uh, people who are of working age pay into it. And then once you reach a certain age or elderly, then you become, uh, then you get a check back from the government. This was the first sort of direct federal government to individual person relief program in American history. It also included people with disabilities, orphans and other disadvantaged groups, but it mainly focused on giving money to the elderly population who again, can't be, you know, can't participate in some of these work programs because they're too old. The Wagner Act provided protection for workers and unions, uh, considered to be perhaps one of the most pro-labor, um, pro-worker laws ever passed. Recall that Franklin Roosevelt had given workers protection in the NIRA. This was struck down as unconstitutional. So the Wagner Act was there to continue to provide protections for workers, give them the right to uh, form unions. Uh, some of the final pieces of the second New Deal uh, also included another showdown with the Supreme Court. Uh, Roosevelt feared that both Social Security and the Wagner Act might be struck down by the Supreme Court. And so he proposed the Supreme Court packing plan, that is to add additional uh, justices or judges until a favorable court, right? So for example, I believe at the time, I believe there were nine at the time. I don't know why I decided to draw all nine of these individuals taking me quite some time. All right, so there's the Supreme Court. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And let's just say for simplicity's sake that when it came to Roosevelt's AAA and NIRA, that one, two, three, four, five said no to the New Deal and one, two, three, four said yes. And so in that case, when you had a program like the AAA, five votes to four, this gets struck down. 
one way that Roosevelt wanted to counterbalance this was say, look, I'm gonna add more people and I'm gonna get to choose those people. So let's say maybe let's add two more. And suddenly when it comes to Roosevelt's legislation, well, look, now there's two more votes for the yes. And so that's why programs like the AAA would stay. But in this case, we're talking about the Wagner Act and Security Act. This plan, the Supreme Court packing plan was fundamentally changing the system of checks and balances that was so, uh, you know, which was really at the, the foundation of what the constitutional system was there for. The reason why you have separate powers is so that one power doesn't become too, uh, one power doesn't become too much stronger than the other one. So unlike laws that you might be able to question the constitutionality of things, the court packing plan was fundamentally altering the, uh, you know, really what is that kind of the cornerstone of the U.S. government. And when Roosevelt came out with this plan, members of Congress actually rejected it. So this was where Roosevelt, you could say, was defeated, where Congress was no longer willing to go along. They said, look, this is going too far in terms of, you know, getting your New Deal legislation passed. Now, ultimately for Roosevelt, it didn't matter. Both the Social Security Act and the Wagner Act were approved by the Supreme Court. Neither of them were struck down as constitutional. But this is probably the argument that conservative critics have against Roosevelt in this sort of illustration here, right? This was simply Roosevelt trying to get too much power, trying to, uh, you know, influence the uh, Supreme Court. Now, one thing that Roosevelt also kept in mind was that a lot of these New Deal programs were expensive, right? In order to build everything that was required to give everybody a job, to provide Social Security to the elderly, you needed to have a lot of money. And Roosevelt was willing to spend more money than he brought in. In other words, to balance the budget, meaning that you only spend what you take in, that for most of the first and second New Deal, Roosevelt didn't do that. In 1937, he had attempted to balance the budget and then the U.S. economy entered into a recession, that is um, kind of a, a loss of jobs, right? A recession is, there's some, there's an actual economic definition to recession. I don't know exactly what that is, but it generally means a loss of production, a loss of jobs, a loss of GDP, gross domestic product. And so this idea that you ought to balance the budget, um, this was shied away from John Maynard Keynes, he's an economist, advocated for more spending and that you look at the budget and say, look, it really doesn't matter how much money you're taking in. It doesn't matter how much money you're spending. You spend as much money as is necessary in order to solve the economy. And after a brief recession in 1937, Roosevelt proceeded with keeping up government spending to keep people employed and to keep the economy going. The last piece that we're going to talk about in terms of Roosevelt's New Deal is the Fair Labor Standards Act. Among various things, this established a minimum wage. That is a minimum wage for which workers will be paid that you can't pay anyone lower than a, a certain price. So what can we say about the New Deal, uh, the first and second New Deal? Did it solve getting the United States out of the Great Depression, which was, again, the whole purpose of the New Deal? The answer is no, right? The New Deal did not get the U.S. out of the Great Depression. What did was World War II, right, which is covered next chapter. However, it did fundamentally change the relationship between the government and the people. It witnessed an increase in national power, right? That is the federal government gained more power that the federal government now became responsible for the economy, the prosperity, and the welfare of its citizens. The most important thing that we say is that the New Deal overall changed the relationship, changed the relationship between citizen citizen and government. You know, whereas before the New Deal, when you looked at things like prosperity, the economy, the welfare of your citizens, 
That was not the job of the federal government to look after that. That was the job of business. That was the job of the economy. That was the job of individuals, right? It was believed that in order to succeed, in order for your welfare, right, to be where it needs to be, you just simply need to work harder. You need more discipline, et cetera, et cetera. What the fundamental or what the uh, New Deal changed was says no. In fact, what is responsible for the economy, what's responsible for prosperity, what's responsible for wealth, or wel uh, welfare is the federal government, right? It is the government's job to fix our economy. That was not the case before. This is a viewpoint that more or less the United States has maintained ever since with maybe a few, um, a few kind of uh, uh, challenges to that. Now, did the, did the New Deal affect everyone equally? Well, no, that wasn't the case. In fact, African Americans, although they did benefit from the New Deal, you know, uh, it was said that the New Deal provided something for everyone. Uh, it did not provide um, you know, benefits equally. So for example, the AAA or the Agricultural Adjustment Act had a negative impact on sharecroppers who lost their job. Again, this was an unintended consequence of that legislation, but most of them tended to be black and African-American. However, Roosevelt at the same time did recognize that African-Americans faced unique problems. He maintained what was called a black cabinet. These were African-American, advisors that Roosevelt would routinely communicate with to address problems specifically for African Americans in the United States. For Native Americans, Roosevelt oversaw the passing of the Indian Reorganization Act or the Indian New Deal, which was probably the most significant legislation passed regarding the status of Native Americans in the United States, really you know, ever since the Dawes Act in the 1880s. In fact, what this did in many cases was to reverse the Dawes Act, which was incredibly damaging to Native Americans. This was 1887, I want to say. And what this allowed for was it stopped assimilation. You know, if we think all the way back to the chapters on the Gilded Age, there was strong pressure on Native Americans to assimilate into American society. The Dawes Act did that, and it helped to restore tribal lands and to create a, a certain semblance, not complete, but at least partial sovereignty. That is the right for tribes and Native Americans themselves to determine their own laws and rules. Again, they still, you know, they were still subject to U.S. law, of course, but this was partial sovereignty was restored. So stopping the damaging pro uh, policies of assimilation, restoring some tribal lands, restoring some semblance of assimilation, uh, you know, this was, again, probably the most consequential legislation passed in regards to the status of Native Americans in the United States. For women in the New Deal, again, it wasn't exactly, um, you know, it wasn't uh, men and women did not benefit equally from the New Deal. There was wage discrimination. That was women were paid less. They were sometimes excluded from certain um, New Deal work programs. Uh, it was also true that when women were included in New Deal work programs, it was typically those who were not married. It was those who had been widowed. Um, you know, it was those who were not, you know, sort of part of married traditional families. Although there were some significant um, progress made for women under Franklin Roosevelt. Frances Perkins, this was the first woman to be part of a presidential cabinet. Again, the cabinet is the president's closest advisors. And of course, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the first lady, and the first lady, if you don't know, is the wife of the president, was very active in issues regarding poverty and civil rights, civil rights being the status of Native Americans, or sorry, the status of African Americans. And, um, you know, this was at a time where the wife of the president or the first lady really didn't have that much of an active role on these issues. And Eleanor Roosevelt was very public 
In fact, sometimes she's referred to as the first modern first lady, that is to be active and to speak out on particular issues, in this case, poverty and civil rights.